Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about non-negative matrix factorization, one of the most widely used method for bioinformatics, computational biology, genomics, and many other fields. Now here is the thing. First of all, we are going to start with matrix factorization. I'm going to motivate you guys with how this thing is done. Then I'm going to talk about the algorithm behind the non-negative matrix factorization or NMF in short. I'm also going to show the intuition, how the formulation has been derived. And finally, that is the most important part. I'm going to show you an example of how this is actually used in real life in the field of bioinformatics. So let's dive in. So first of all, let's see this nice matrix right here. You can see four people sitting right here and there are five movies. So each person has given some rating to each movie. For example, person one has given movie one rating three. Person 3 has given movie 3 a rating of 1. So the rating has been given out of 5. So if you have a rating of 5, that means the person really, really liked the movie. So let's see some dependencies in this particular matrix. So first of all, as you can see that this row and this row are actually equal. So what does that mean? That means the preference of the first person and the third person are very, very similar. That's the thing. So okay. Another thing is, you can see that if we add up the scores of person 2 and person 3, then we get the score of person 4. So what, the, what does this mean? I mean, this may mean many things, but one thing it may mean is maybe person 1 likes comedy type movies and person, person 3 likes action type movies. And maybe the last person likes both action and comedy. That can happen. So we can see similar things in movies as well. For example, movie M1 and movie M4. They have very similar ratings across the different people. That means maybe they are very similar movies. Similarly, we can see the last column, the M5, is actually an average of the M2 and M3 column. For example, 3 is the average of 2 and 4. And also like 4 is the average of 3 and 5. So what does that mean? So suppose M2 is a comedy movie and M3 is an action movie. Now maybe M5 has some comedy and some action in it and so it's the average of M2 and M3. I mean, I'm not saying that that is the case, but maybe it is the case. So what I'm trying to say is that when we like put all these people and put all these movies and their ratings in a nice little table, then that table actually has some patterns. So let's actually look at this more deeply. So let's assume that we have these two intrinsic features that are actually responsible for this kind of ratings. So we have the comedy and we have the action. So there are four people right here. And if you see a tick, that means this person likes comedy movies and cross means he does not like the action movies. So for example, this person likes both kinds of movies. Let's also assume that there are a few scorings for each movie as well. For example, M1. M1 has like three score for comedy and one score for action. That means it is mostly a comedy movie, but it has some action in it. And M4 is the opposite of M1 and M3 is like hardcore action and some comedy and so on and so forth. So basically with these scores, we can sort of see like uh, which movie belongs to which genre. So that's the thing. Now, how exactly are we going to get the scores that we have been seeing in the nice 2D table before? So for example, if we want to, if we ask ourselves, like what is the score that the person one will give to movie number one, then this is how we get this. So we are going to multiply one into three and then we add zero into one. Zero because the person doesn't like action movies. So the rating is three for movie one given by the person one. Similarly, we can see this. So this person likes both kind of genre. So this will be one into one plus one into four for movie three and the score will be five. So in the same way, if we put this table like this, so it's a four into two matrix and we put the other table like this, this is a 2 into 5 matrix. And if we matrix multiply them together, we can actually get this table. So for example, if we take the dot product of this row and I mean these two vectors, we are going to get this value 3. And if we do the dot product of these two vectors, we are going to get the value of 5. Okay, now obviously, I mean, the main question is how do we get those two matrices? Like we saw those nice two matrices where where we have the uh, preferences of different people and we have the genre classification or rating of the different movies. How can we get that? So actually, that is where the matrix factorization comes into play. So for example, let me give an example right here. So I mean, suppose we 
we are thinking or, or we are assuming that we have two intrinsic features, F1 and F2. Now, previously, I told you guys that F1 is comedy and F2 is action, but we actually don't know that in advance. We don't know that. We assume that maybe F1 and F2 may be comedy and action, but we don't know that. We just know that there are some hidden intrinsic factor based on which people decide that there are ratings on the movies. That is the thing. So what we do in the algorithms, in the matrix factorization algorithms is we randomly initialize this matrix and this matrix. So we call this W0 and H0. So zero means iteration number zero. So it's an iterative process. So iteratively, we are going to update these values. So in the initial iteration, we are just randomly initializing these things. Now understand that all these values have to be non-negative. So they can be zero as well, but they cannot be negative because we are saying that non-negative matrix factorization. That means all these factors, all these values will have to be non-negative. That is the main point right here. Okay. Now, if we multiply W0 and H0, then we are going to get this matrix, which I'm calling X0 prime. Any X prime means that, I mean, this is an approximation basically of the original matrix. Now, if you look at X0 prime, if you look at these two matrices, then you definitely see that there's a lot of difference between these two matrices. So how do we quantify this difference? It's very simple. We just subtract these two matrices and take the Frobenius norm. So what is the Frobenius norm? It's very simple. For example, we have to do 1.44 minus 3 whole square plus 1.37 minus 1 whole square plus 2.26 minus 1 whole square. So we have to take the difference and whole square everything and add everything up. And finally, we take the square root. So it's a similar thing as Euclidean distance. I mean, if you know Euclidean distance, then you know what I'm talking about. So if you know Euclidean distance, you know what I'm talking about. So this is that, I mean, Frobenius norm. So now let's dive in to how exactly are we going to update W0 and H0 so that this Frobenius norm becomes very, very small. So this value becomes very, very small because that is what we actually want. We want this matrix to look very much like this matrix. So this is the formula to update the H matrix. So obviously there is another formula for W matrix as well. So let's first explain this one. So let's first explain what's going on here. So this is the H0, the initial H matrix. Then we are doing a element-wise matrix multiplication. That means the dimension of this whole thing is the same as H0. That is the thing. So in the numerator, we are doing a simple matrix multiplication. And also in the denominator, we are doing another matrix multiplication. And then we are doing an element-wise division. That means each element of the matrices are going to be divided by each other. So each element of the numerator matrix will be divided by the matrix of the denominator. So that is what's going on in this particular formula. Now, let's understand this from an intuitive point of view of what's going on. So you can see that W0, H0, if we multiply them, we are going to get the X0 prime. That means the approximate matrix. Now, if X0 prime would be equal to our original X, which we want to approximate, then this whole thing would actually become an identity matrix. That means H0 would not change. So H1 would be equal to H0, right? So this is, I think, we all understand. But that will only happen when we are going to completely converge. But initially, that will not happen. Suppose initially, the values of X0 prime are actually much larger than X. Then what we are going to get from this whole thing, from this whole formula, is a matrix where all the elements are actually small, like smaller than 1. So it can be 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, this kind of thing. So if you multiply the elements of H0 with those values, then H0 will become smaller. So that will be an adjustment of H in the decreasing direction. That is the first thing. So the opposite thing is also true if the values of X0 prime are actually smaller than X. So if these values are smaller than X, then this whole thing, the values of this whole matrix are going to be larger than 1. Suppose 2, 3, 4, 1.5, etc. And then the values of H will increase. So not only does it actually tell you the direction of adaptation or change of H, it also tells you the magnitude of how much you need to change it. That is the thing. We have the same formula, similar formula for W as well. So one thing you need to note is this is not H0, this is H1. So we are always going to use the latest, latest H and latest W that we have got. So as you can see, W0, H1 is also an approximation of X and I mean X1 prime, let's call it. So again, we have the exact same thing. So if X1 prime and X would be equal, then this will be an identity and then W0 will not have changed. 
So this is a multiplicative update and we can do this again. For example, iteration number two, we can again use H1 and W1 and here H2 to actually get ourselves the new H2 and W2. And we are going to keep doing this until we converge. That means our error, the Fabinius norm error is actually very, very small. Or we have reached certain number of iterations and we don't want to continue anymore. That is the thing. Now, here is the interesting part. I have told you before that W0 and H0 will be initialized non-negatively. That means all the initial values will be either 0 or above 0, not less than 0. So a few things are, if we multiply two non-negative numbers, we are always going to get another non-negative number. So this updating formula, the multiplicative update, makes sure that the H and W matrix always remain non-negative. That is the thing. Okay, another thing is, since we cannot actually make the value of W and H, any of the values of W and H less than zero, we are actually going to see a lot of zeros in the W and H. So those zeros will correspond to features and like rows or columns, which are not important at all for reconstructing the original matrix. So we are only going to get larger values for in places which are important for reconstructing the original matrix. So that is the thing. So now another last thing is how many intrinsic or hidden features are you going to use? So previously we saw two. So we had two hidden features. So suppose your original matrix is very large. Say you have 1000 rows and 2000 columns. Are we still going to use two hidden features? You can do that definitely, but probably it will not converge in that case. So in those cases, you would want to increase the hidden dimension number. That is the thing. Now, obviously you may be wondering, where exactly did we derive this formula from? So we have this nice multiplicative formula for update. So where did this formula come from? So let's see this from an intuitive perspective. So this is the Fabinius norm that we saw before. So WH is the approximation of X, which is X prime. And we have to minimize this whole thing. So the variable right here is W and H. So X is not the variable. This is very, very important because X is the original matrix and we cannot change the original matrix. We can only change W and H. That is the thing. So the goal, the goal that we are chasing is we want to minimize this L, the error function, right? That is what we want to do. So if we want to minimize the function, what do we need to do? We need to take the derivative of that function with respect to the variables. So let's assume that we want to get the formula for H. So we actually get the derivative of L with respect to H and set it to zero. So if we do this and if we do some calculations, ultimately we are going to see something like this. So if we just simply like do this, we are going to get one. I mean, it's not actually one, it's identity matrix. So this will happen only during convergence. So in order to converge, we are going to multiply this particular number, particular matrix with the original H. So that is the thing and we are going to keep updating it. Now we could have done gradient descent. So if you guys know about gradient descent, you know that we normally need to subtract these things in order to do the update, but we cannot do this here because we need to make sure that our W and H always remain non-negative. That is why we are doing the multiplicative update. So that is the whole story. So now we are going to see a very, very interesting application of NMF or non-negative matrix factorization. So this is let me talk about this a little bit. So this is about finding the mutational signatures or mutational processes which are responsible for a mutation profile of a certain tumor or a certain sample or a certain patient. So mutation signature derivation using NMF is a very popular thing in the world of bioinformatics. So I'm talking about this right now. And I think it will be very, very intuitive after you understand the process on why this kind of algorithms are used. So in this example, we have five tumors, five tumor samples. And let's say we just look at three mutations. So obviously there are many different mutations possible, but we are only considering three kinds of mutations, mutation from A to C, T to G, and T to A. By the way, if you don't know, DNA has four kinds of bases, A, T, C, G. So that's what I'm talking about right here. Okay. So for example, tumor one has 10% A to C mutation, 30% of T to G mutation, and 60% of T to A mutation. On the contrary, tumor four has 5% A to C, 5% T to G, and 90% T to A. So different uh, tumors have different mutation profiles. Now the mutation profile that is developed by tumor one, obviously is the result 
of a few mutational processes. So maybe he has gone through a few processes in his life because of which he has got these mutations. So what are those? So let's just talk about four. Let's just talk about four for this particular example. So there is this age-related uh, influence. So if a person is aging, then he acquires some mutation. And let's assume that the mutation, I mean, for aging, we will have the highest mutation rate for A to C. So A to C should have the highest frequency. T to G should have the second highest, say around 30% mark. Then uh, T to A will have the lowest, maybe around the 10% or 15% mark. So similarly, for smoking, like if someone smokes, then probably he will not acquire these two mutations, A to C and T to G. But most of his mutations will be from T to A. So then there are ultraviolet light, viral infections, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are some of the mutation signatures that are responsible for getting these mutation profiles. But the real question is, if we ask, like, I mean, what are the components, what are the mutational signatures affecting the mutation profile of tumor 1, then what is the answer? So I'm showing you two examples here. For example, for tumor 1, so tumor 1 profile can be visualized like this. So this is 10%, this is 30%. And this is 60%. So you can actually multiply signature 1 by 0.5 and signature 4 by 1 and multiply the other ones by 0 and reconstruct this tumor 1 profile. So that is the interesting part. So we now know that the age, the person's age is affecting 50% of the profile and his viral infection is affecting the other percentage of the profile. So that's the thing. So for tumor 4, for tumor 4, if you want to look at tumor 4, you are seeing that like all the weights, I mean, it's it's just S2. So tumor 4 profile, so this profile, where this is 5%, 5% and 90%. So this is just like S2, right? So basically this guy was smoking a lot of cigarettes or I don't know what he was smoking and he got his profile exactly like, I mean, from the smoking signature. So the moral of the story is you have different signatures and you want to actually put some weights to each of the signatures to find out the actual mutation profile of the person. Now, how does this relate to NMF? Let's actually look at that. So first of all, we actually don't know these signatures in advance. I mean, there is a large database in where you have many signatures, but we don't really know which signature is affecting these uh, tumors, right? So we can actually do an NMF on this. This is the original matrix. So we, we will actually decompose this into W and H. So W being uh, tumors and then exposure. So what is exposure? So 0 0.5001 is the exposure for tumor 1 and 0, 0.100 0, 0 is the exposure for tumor 4, right? Because, so how much weight we are putting on each signature is the exposure. So that is the exposure. So you can see four values in each row. It is going to be matrix multiplied. So this can be a bit confusing. This is not X, by the way. This is not X. This is the multiplication sign. This is the matrix multiplication sign. Assume that. So it will be multiplied by the signature matrix. So signatures are in the, I mean, in this downward manner in the rows. So the rows are the signatures and the columns are the mutations. Okay. So for example, signature one had a mutation profile with three mutations. I mean, you saw that. Similarly, signature 2 has three mutations and so on and so forth. So if we multiply these two matrices, I mean, we are going to get back this original matrix, not the original one, an approximation of the original one, and we can use the NMF algorithm to derive these two matrices. So if we do that, we are going to know exactly what are the signatures, and we are going to know exactly how much exposure was done by each signature to derive the mutation profile of each tumor, right? So we had no idea we had no idea whatsoever, like what are the signatures and we don't know about the exposure, but we can get both using this method. And after getting those signatures, we can actually match them with large mutation signature databases. And we can see, we can actually say that the most similar signatures are the one affecting the person and also by how much using the exposure values. So that is how easily we can use NMF to do these complicated things. So hopefully the explanation was clear in this video. If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe and share the video. So there is a donation link as well in the description. So if you want to donate to our channel to support us, you can do that as well. Thanks very much.